Well, good morning. I hope you think I'm cool <laughs> after the tw next 20 minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes. <laughs> wow, what great worship this morning, right? I love that song, In the Room. I love that. I was walking our dog this morning, worshiping in that to that very song, and I'm like, God, have them play that song, and they did. <laughs> so I know he is in the room, and I'm thankful that each one of you are here. Welcome to Wren, you know, welcome. We've got a lot of people here. My family's here, my granddaughters, my pickleball peeps, um, <laughs> all of uh, great, great people, great friends. So thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Kim Robinson. I'm married to John Robinson. Uh, we have been attending Wren for around eight years. We have five beautiful, talented children and seven amazing grandchildren. If you've been coming during June, you've been um, treated to a lot of good one thing answers. So when Jeff po posed the question to me, I thought to myself, oh, that's going to be so easy, right? So I started thinking about it and praying about it and, well, what is it, God? You know, what is that one thing? It's hard to answer that. I wonder if some of you that have been coming, have you thought of your answers, what your answer would be? My purpose today is to encourage each and every one of you about the faithfulness of God, how he is always with us. Um, like, just like Ryan was saying, in our good times and our bad but when we are with him, he brings us that unspeakable joy, right? So back to my answer. My answer to question one is, over the course of your spiritual journey with God, what's that one thing you have sensed from God repeatedly in your life? And it is, drum roll, surrender, Kim. Surrender, I don't know if you guys have watched The Wizard of Oz. It was my daughter's favorite movie growing up, so we watched it like every day. And um, I think it's Dorothy and the crew are in the poppy field, and the Wicked Witch of the West comes on her broom, and she writes in the sky what? Surrender, Dorothy. So I feel like that's what God has been telling me all my life. Surrender, Kim. I sought as even a young child to um, lead a holy life. When I got to high school, I was bullied for it. And perhaps it was the rejection of my peers that led me to an ungodly life for many, many years. But God is so faithful that he brought me back to kingdom living. And I see the fingerprints of God all over my life. And as I read the Bible, I see my DNA in that story. Because, you know, the Bible is our story. It's a story about us. And in the Bible are four beautiful scriptures that I wanted to share with you. The first one is Luke 12, 7. Indeed, God numbers all the hairs on your head. Isn't that amazing? That just always moves my heart. Isaiah 49, 16. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Our names, each of your names are written on the palm of God's hands. Psalm 31, 15 says, our times are in his hands. We have no reason to worry, to have anxiety, because God has the control, but he has our times in his hands. And finally, Revelation 21, 27 is, the Lamb's book of life have our names written in it. That is so powerful and worth celebrating and worth surrendering to a God who knows me, numbers my hairs, and has my name written on the palm of his hand. All through my life, God has been leading me through my God-given passions. Um, my first real work was with um, intellectually disabled adults for over 20 years. I ran and owned and operated nursing homes for them. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. Fast forward to 2001, and God intervened again, and I married the love of my life, John, where um, in 2003, 2003 we got married. And um, four days later after we were married, I was carted off, not to a beautiful honeymoon in Tahiti, but to a Christian retreat. Yeah, <laughs> 72 hours. 
to a Christian retreat with all women. They took our phones away from us. I remember trying to call John on, on Friday afternoon. He wouldn't even talk to me. Now, this is four days after you get married. But by the end of that 72 hours, I was fallen madly in love with Jesus, completely and madly in love. So I surrendered my life to him again. In 2005, he asked me to sell my business, which I did. And I remember sitting in my prayer chair talking to God and being so lost because I'm such a person-driven um, personality. I don't know if you're like that. And most of that purpose is what I think, not what God had in store. But he met me there, and he will meet you too. He will put your passions to work as well. Ephesians 1.18 is a, um, one of my favorite verses, and it's Paul writing to the Ephesians. And it says, May the eyes of your heart be enlightened so that you may know the hope of your calling. Did you all know that you have a hope? That you have a calling? That greatest hope and that greatest calling is to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ and to expect his return, to wait expectantly for him to return. That is the hope of our calling. That is what we are called to surrender to. I surrendered one more time in 2010 when God called me to um, build the Decatur House in Prayer. It's a beautiful place. I don't know if anyone's ever been here in here. I know a lot of you have been. But it's a great place of encounter with Jesus where we worship and pray and intercede for the city, for others, for um, social, the end of social injustices. injustices. Um, it was a big surrender because it, it took a lot of time with Jesus. No day ever really was how I would picture it. It just is how God had pictured it. But God, once again, 15 years later, and it was a God-sent spiritual 15 years, let me tell you, but God asked us to step down from leadership. So when he did that, once again, I had to sit with him in my prayer chair, and I read Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. And if you can get that scripture in your heart, it is a great one because when things don't go your way, as Ryan had said, you can bring that scripture to mind and know that God is always with us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But when we lose our life for him, he is there. We get him. That's the great thing. So all these surrenders were leading up to the last 18 man, months, which I surrendered my life again to God and um, went back to school after 40 years. I graduated 40 years from Millican, and he called me back to get a master's degree. And in May of this year, I got a master's degree in biblical exposition. <laughs> Woo! So 40 years ago, there weren't even computers. They were called word processors. And everything today is all computer. And so um, when I first started doing it, I really had to have a talk to talk, talk one on one with God and say, hey, you called me to this. You must show up. And he did. So it was an amazing time. But I want to answer the second, because I don't have a lot of time left. I want to answer the second question, which is, how has acting on his guidance shaped the path your life has taken? Surrendering to God has meant uh, involved myself, but this large surrender that I had to give up started in Wednesday, April 8th in 2020. And it involved my husband. It was the beginning of COVID. Illinois was on lockdown. I don't know if you guys remember those days. It seems like it's 100 years ago. But we had to wear masks. We had to wear gloves. Remember going to the grocery store? It felt like you were taking your um, life in your own hands. I'd come home and I'd, you know, wash off all the, all the canned goods and everything. So there was a large, uh, big storm in Decatur April 8th on Wednesday. And um, the rain and wind was coming into our second floor window in our kitchen. My husband went over to shut the window and he was sucked out of the window. 
and fell to the ground 22 feet. I had turned to get more towels, and when I turned around, he was gone. I ran over to the window, looked down, and saw him. And so I ran quickly down our stairs. I called my friend Tammy Laffrey and said, you've got to call people. John's fallen out the window. You've got to call people. You've got to get people praying immediately. Then I called 911. It took six times before anyone answered the 911 call because of the storm. My sister and brother-in-law rushed over as did our great friends, best friends, uh, Mark and Dan and Johnny. And I had drugged John in from the wind and the rain. But then they had put blankets over him waiting. 45 minutes the ambulance took to get there. He was bleeding from the top of his head. When the lady finally called me from the Springfield 911, she said that, you know, is, what is your emergency? And I said, my husband is dying. Now, remember, it's COVID, so I couldn't even accompany him to the hospital. He was taken to St. Mary's. Um, they called me from St. Mary's about an hour and a half later and said that he was so critical they were air flighting him over to St. John's. Couldn't go. The nurse told me that he was so critical that if I went over to St. John's right then and there, then um, I could possibly see him. And remember, nobody could come over. Our daughter was nine months pregnant with her second child. And so she couldn't even come over because we didn't know what about COVID, right? Thousands of people were dying every day. So I get to St. John's. I walk in the room. They'd given him last rites. I prayed over him. Um, I got to stay about an hour, and then I had to just come home and sit and wait and pray. God met me in in the most extraordinary ways. And one reason I wanted you to know about those scriptures is if he met me, he'll meet you every single time. And I had to surrender John to God and say, God, if if you want John more than me, take him. I'm okay with that. And I remember taking my dog over to, Saint, to South Shores Park, and we'd just walk, and I would worship, and I would pray. And it was just totally amazing. So John called me finally on Saturday, because once again, I couldn't be there. And he said, Kim, I'm dying. And I said, no, you're not dying. I said, you would have died on Wednesday if you were going to die. But then I would immediately call the spiritual people at St. John's and send them to their room. And um, because we're people of prayer, right? What do you do when you need? What do you do when you need something? We pray. We pray. And I think they kind of got tired of hearing my voice. But I don't care. Because he, you know, if someone calls you and says that, they need God. And that's who we are. We are called to meet people, to go and pray for them so that they get that touch of God. Anyway, um, so John um, ended up having to have surgery. He had a broken pelvis. He had broke every um, rib he had. He broke his right shoulder. He broke his back. And he had um, 25 staples in his head. John is a miracle. Nine days later, he came home in a wheelchair. And John, stand up so they can see. He is a miracle. That is the goodness of God. That is the goodness of God. And once again, if he meets me, he will. Right, meet you. So, so great. Luke 17, 33. A friend asked me, what has all this surrendering in my life cost me? Well, it's cost me a thousand cuts. But the great thing is that whoever tries to lose his life Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life will preserve it. We get him every single time. God completely healed John, and he, complete, he didn't completely heal me, but he did cause me to fall more in love with him as I surrendered to him. In March of this year, another surrender was about to occur. 
We came home for Easter week as our daughter, Drew, had to have her kidney removed. I was excited to be home with family and friends in our church family and attend Easter at Wren. If you've never been to Easter at Wren, you got to come because it's so exciting, and there's always this Holy Spirit undercurrent going. So I was just so excited to be home, and I wanted to come to Wren and help decorate, and, you know, I sat with God, and I complained. And I said, you know, I want to go to Wren, but, you know, I feel like I should probably do other things. And my own pursuit of my own greatness never ceases to baffle me. After 65 years, you would think I would be over myself already. But I'm not. So the Lord helped me. And he reminded me that day that Drew was going to her own Calvary on Friday, that she was going to lose her kidney, and that she needed her mother by her side, interceding and believing for her. And Drew is doing fantastic She's back at work, and she is just a joy, just a joy. So my question to you is this, because I'm running out of time. What's the answer to the question for you guys? What's the answer? You know, Christianity is not a passive religion. We have a part to play in the future of this world. And we have a participation, a triangular participation with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So as we choose to live out the hope of our calling and we step out in faith with him, he deposits his spirit in us. And then as we step out and help others, they feel that touch. They feel that healing touch, that restoration. So I encourage you, to study the Bible, to pray as, as often as you can, pray without ceasing, and seek to surrender your life to God. Thank you.